Jessica Carter. It's nice to see you. Um, and I see so many friends I know already, so that's nice. Um, I'm Dr. Andrea Anderson. I am the director here at Lucy Brock. For many of you, this is gonna be a review about what it's like to be in the lab school. Uh, others, I don't recognize names or faces just yet, but um, we'll soon become friends, I bet, because you'll take 3250 with me. So Lucy Brock Child Development Lab Program is a co-curricular experience for students in uh, the College of Education, primarily family and child study students, either child development or birth through kindergarten teacher ed. So if you're in this class, you fall in one of those categories. And so we're here for you to make a connection between what you're learning in your classes, the theory and the practice. And there are some things that you need to know before you come here. And as I understand it, Ms. Carter, you're gonna, these friends will be joining us after spring break. Is that correct? So um, we're gonna go over and talk about um, what the expectations are, uh, what you can expect from us and what we will expect from you. If at any time you need to stop me, uh, please feel free to do so. Um, Ms. Carter, can I share my screen? Would that be possible? I hope so. <laughs> um. Let's see here. Let me, let me try that again. Yes. All right, do you see a PowerPoint there? Very yes. good, okay. So, Lucy Brock has been around uh, for about 80 years. Actually, we just celebrated our 80th anniversary and so I did my undergraduate work here. Um, what we want for you is to come into this space, join us in this community of practice and learn from what it is that we're showing you here. Um, <clears throat> Lucy Brock has a very specific philosophy. I would encourage you, you've heard this in your 2000 level courses, um, to go look at our website, look at our philosophy, our mission. Our primary mission is to serve you as students here at Appalachian, but it is also to move the field of early care and education forward. And so that's what our main focus is here. I'm gonna give you some contact and I will share this with Ms. Carter and she can post this on your As You Learn site. Here is my contact information. If you need to miss your lab, you can email me and Ms. Carter to let us know that you're not gonna be here and what your plan is to make your lab up. I will look to see if I can accommodate that plan. Typically after spring break, it gets really busy around here. But so here is my email address, my phone number, and also the Lucy Brock website. I would encourage you if you have not had an opportunity to go to that site that you do that so that you can read more about us. There's a nice video there you may choose to take a look at and um, gather some more information in terms of what inspires us as teachers and how we create the program here. Oh dear, let's see if I can get back to my PowerPoint. I knew better than to do that. There we go. Do you see the PowerPoint? Right. The first thing that you need to do, and, and some of you have already done this for other classes and you will need to complete it again, is you need to sign the confidentiality agreement. Now I'm gonna stop my share because um, I need to see you head on. When you join this community of practice, you join a professional group of educators who understand that our primary 
mission or goal is to do no harm to children. And so that means you must protect their confidentiality when you're here in the lab. You will be working directly with them. You're gonna be working with children with challenging behaviors, children who are going through big transitions at home, children who are being raised by grandparents, children who are in foster care, children who are in LBGTQI families, and we need to be respectful that these families have trusted us with their children. And they also trust us with very um, sensitive things about their families. So you need to be sure that you have read that confidentiality agreement and you understand that you have permission to talk about what you see in this context with your classmates, with Ms. Carter, um, with me, if you see something that you don't understand when you're here in the lab, you can certainly come into my office and we can talk about it. You can talk with the teachers that you're working with. What you don't have permission to do is talk about it at Mellon Mushroom with your sweet mates. You don't have permission to take photos and post those on social media. If we find out that that happens, the consequences will be swift and acute, okay? That's, we will protect the children who are here. So please don't be tempted to do that. We know they're sweet and cute and all that, but you're here very specifically to learn about um, their development and how to guide their behavior. So when you complete this survey, you will put in your banner ID number and your banner ID will be your key to get into the space. So when you come in, you will swipe your app card and I'll talk to you about that in just a moment. But before we leave um, the confidentiality agreement, are there any questions about that? I bet you've heard it before, haven't you? <laughs> so, all right, let me uh, share my screen again. So when you come into the lab, depending which classroom that you sign up for, you could be in an infant toddler classroom. These are our infant toddler teachers in IT1. This is Cassandra and Julia. In IT2, you're gonna see Casey, Jennifer, and Emily. And then in preschool, you're gonna see Jennifer and Jules. And these are the folks that you're going to be spending time with when you're in the classroom. As far as how to get to the, the lab, this is the side of the College of Education that faces uh, King Street, this is Hamby Alley, that's adjacent to the Wright College of Education. This is the side door at the elevators, and you're going to come out and walk down um, the paved sidewalk here. And then you will see the infant toddler playground on the outside of the school. You're just going to follow that sidewalk right around to the front door, okay? And at the front door, you will see your card reader here. So when you come, this first door is always unlocked. It's the second door that's always locked. So to gain access to the building, you're going to swipe your card. You'll see a green light and you'll hear a click. Now, here's the rule. No app card, no access to the building. Your confidentiality agreement is how we put your access into the building. So there's a couple reasons for that. First of all, it's a real school with children here spending their days and our first priority is to keep them safe. And so we wanna limit access to who has um, an opportunity to come into this building. The second is if there is an emergency, one year the pipes burst on the third floor and we had to get everyone out quickly. I was able to go access this system and we could make sure that everybody was out of the building. So it's to keep children safe and it's also to keep you safe. So let me be clear, no app card, no access. 
So you're going to come into the space. You'll see my office down here on the left. The kitchen is on the right. Um, at the end, you'll see our giraffe deer. It's how you're through your lens, what that animal is. And then um, you're going to take the right down the hallway. As you do that, you're going to see some documentation panels on the wall. Um, you're going to pass the observation booth. This is very important. Lucy Brock is in that free school. We have a child with very intense nut allergies. So please don't bring your Snickers bar in here or your peanut butter sandwich. Um, they could literally pick up the wrapper and have um, go into anaphylactic shock. So please help us keep uh, the child safe. So those are the infant toddlers. So congratulations, you've graduated from the booth into the class now, so you don't need to worry about that. But when you come into the space, you'll find your classroom, okay? And this is just at Lucy Brock. I'll talk with you about the offsites in just a moment. So all the way down the hall in 26A, it's the Infant Toddler 1 classroom, 22A, the Infant Toddler 2 classroom, and 20A, the preschool classroom. So depending on for which classroom you sign up for, that's where you're gonna go, okay? Sorry, friends, I have a very um, quick mouse. Here's the other thing, now, just like with the confidentiality agreement, now you join our community of practice and you need to have professional dress, okay? So um, Ms. Carter's known me a long time. If it looks like you can wear it to the gym, you shouldn't wear it in here. It's a professional school. There are people in the booth who are now observing you because you are in the classroom with us. Your body needs to be covered. You're gonna be bending over, stooping down. So we wanna protect you. We had an incident where someone wore a very short dress in here and um, the folks in the booth uh, were taking pictures as they were making their way around the classroom. Um, and of course we quickly stopped that, but I can't be in that booth all the time to know what students are doing. So please just be thoughtful about that. Our goal is to help you begin your professional practice. And part of that practice is dressing appropriately when you're in the space. I'm gonna stop the share for just a moment because I want to give you an opportunity to ask any questions about to this point. Will this PowerPoint be posted on our class site anywhere? I will share it with Ms. Carter. Yes, I will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Okay. So when you come to Lucy Brock, if the children are out on the playground, you will need to be out on the playground, so come prepared for that. Um, thank goodness it's March, but we also get big storms in March sometimes. They come quickly, but they leave quickly. And if it's cold and not dangerous for children, we will be outside. Gonna start that again. So here's the infant toddler playground. You'll pass it when you come into the building. Here is the entrance to the preschool playground. So at the giraffe there, instead of the right, you'll take the left to go outside. And then you'll just come right out and be outside in um, the outdoor playground. Now, if you choose to go to one of the offsite classrooms, I've given the information for you here. This is Blowing Rock. Pre-K, that's one of your choices. The teachers there are Caroline Phillips and Victoria Gaultier. That's in downtown Blowing Rock. If you do, if you put 
Glowing Rock School into your MAP system, you'll make it there with no problem. You will need to go into the front office and sign in each time. You'll have to be buzzed into the school and you'll also have to take your driver's license in with you. Your second choice, if you're interested in being in a public school site is the Cove Creek Collaborative at Cove Creek Elementary. Those teachers are Jordan and Molly. That road is actually not marked. So you'll use Vanderpool Campground as your landmark as you go to find that school. It's a really, all the schools are great, but this one's way back in the country um, if you're interested in working with a more rural population. And then finally, your last choice is Parkway Collaborative Pre-K with teachers uh, Julia and Shanda. And that's 421 East as you're going to Deep Gap. Cove Creek is on the western side of the county. So those are your choices. So just be sure that you understand. We're happy that you're going to be here. We want you to um, practice what you're learning with Ms. Carter. We want you to enjoy it. Um, we want you to play. I think she will give you some guidance about how to get children to come and be where you are. But the, the, the easiest thing I think for you to do is when you get here, um, put your hands on the materials and start playing. And you don't have to say a word. If you start playing, they will come to see what you're doing. If you are sick, please, please, please do not come. We will work with you to make up your lab hours. Um, the university is dropping the mask mandate on March the 7th. I don't know what that means for us at Lucy Brock. We're getting some confirmation about whether we will still be wearing masks here or not. So um, as soon as I know, I will share that with you, Ms. Carter, and you can pass that on to your students. And the first thing you do when you go in the classroom is wash your hands. Um, wash your hands when you get there and then wash your hands when you leave, okay? So that's it, that's Lucy Brock. Um, do pay attention to how the teachers are talking with children, um, how they use language to help guide children's behavior, how they use their bodies, all those things where they position their bodies in space. You'll be able to see that and then practice that. Ms. Carter, is there, before I open it up for questions, is there anything else that you would like to add to that? Not right now. I think that's probably okay. the gist of it. And we'll talk a little more um, before, you know, the week of about expectations in the room and such. I did want to ask, because I made a note, there was a specific question last week or week before. Um, when I, so the document is live now that they can add to uh, pencil in their schedule and mm -hmm. you can still see that. I think it's shared with you. Yeah, I, I think so. I haven't looked at it recently, but I, I will. The week um, of spring break, I'll, tr I'll probably add that to our master lab schedule. And that's what, so if someone needs to make an adjustment to that they need to email you regardless of how close it is to their yeah so what we find is is this it, at this time in the semester it gets really busy in the lab right so and again if you're sick don't come but you may only be able to come on friday to make your time up and we've got a lot of practicum students on friday and there could be as six big bodies in the classroom. That's too many. You're not gonna get a good experience there. So you'll email me, you'll email and CC Ms. Carter, and then you and I will work out a schedule to make your time up so that I can assure that you get a good experience when you're here, right? Um, I'll work with your schedule, but I also have to be cognizant of how many big bodies are in the room. Thank you. All right, students, are there any questions? Jessalyn, no flying plants today, I'm so glad. 
in 3251 of Jessalyn's plants attacked her. We we missed it on the video, but um, <laughs> we had a good yeah, laugh yeah. over there. I actually just got a lot more. Do you guys want to see? <laughs> <laughs> I got all of these ones up behind here. Oh my goodness. Uh-huh. And then my uh, my other window over here is like completely filled. Well, you better water them because that was traumatic. I want you to know when that plant attacks <laughs> you. Oh all yeah, right. I do. <laughs> and so uh let's see, Jesslyn's been here, Gigi's been here, Maddie's been here, Mercy's been here. Let me see who else. Destiny. Doesn't, I don't think Destiny's been here, but she has class with me. Grace has. Delaney, you've been here, haven't you? Yep. And Olivia. So lots of people know, know the sitch. So, you know, you can reach out to them, Ms. Carter, but definitely reach out to me. And again, if you see something and you don't understand it, come find me and we'll talk about it. Um, don't want you, especially in terms of guidance, you know, sometimes natural consequences may not, may seem tough, um, but we'll talk about what the rationale and what that teacher was thinking and why she chose that course of action so that you understand, okay? Bueller, Bueller, y'all are too young for that. You don't know it, but Anything else? Okay. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Thank you so much for coming on. Mm -hmm. Take care. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. All right. Uh, so, if you haven't already done so, please make sure that you take a look at your schedule and plug yourself into four two hour time blocks um, for your Lucy Brock lab hours. And then just to kind of mention the quiz, there was some confusion. I made an operator error when I was um, adjusting the timing on that. And I set it for 2 a.m. and set it 2 p.m. because I'm not accustomed to military time. Um, and so that's what happened there. But the quiz is open and due today by 2 p.m. If you have not already gone in and taken that, please do so probably right after class or you won't have much time left. Um, and one more note on just kind of business. I have the document open, so I'm gonna share my screen. Your async content for this week is your final lab assignment um, before you move into, you know, we'll kind of shift gears after spring break and move into the, uh, the reflections on your classroom observations in class observations. So this last lab is kind of in the same vein as the conversation analysis and those other assignments that we did. This one is going to ask you to watch a video that is from Lucy Brock um, posted to the class page. So when you open up the assignment for this lab, uh, you'll see the video and then you'll see these assignment guidelines that I'm sharing right now. Um, you will need to refer to the chapter in the text, um, pages 183 to 190 have some specific examples of these strategies listed on this document uh, with regard to facilitating personal care routines. Um, and we, we want you to watch the video and observe for how are these strategies being used and give some concrete examples of what you see that relates to what's talked about in the textbook in terms of goals for personal care routines and strategies used. Any questions on this? This will be due at the end of the weekend, um, so Sunday by midnight. No questions? Okay. So this uh, goes along with what we'll be talking about today, which is guidance as it relates to personal care routines. And I thought that I had my PowerPoint open, so give me just a minute. Hmm.
sorry. <clears throat> So while, while this is pulling up, um, what are the personal care routines that you can think of that happen in a classroom? Toileting. Toileting and diapering. What else? Nap time. Washing hands. Hand washing, huge, it happens all the time. Um, and did you say napping? And then there's one more that we haven't mentioned that I think of off the top. Eating. Meal times. Yes. So those are kind of your primary personal care routines. Um, there may be the occasional, you know, change of clothes or something like that that kind of comes up um, as a result of something that's gone on that day. But in general, these diapering, toileting routines, meal times, um, hand washing, those are sort of, and, and nap time built into the daily routine, right? And they happen all the time. Um, and so it's very important that we don't sort of neglect these opportunities uh, for embedding learning, embedding, um, you know, nurture and care and fun uh, and all sorts of things that we do with children, you know, when we're quote unquote playing with them, those same sort of things need to be happening during personal care routines. Um, at the end, we'll talk a little bit about variations in culture and how that might play into personal care for children. Um, and, and then kind of in that same line, how important it is to coordinate with families around these ideas. And so what we know about personal care routines is, you know, I just said children are not just learning when they're playing, they're learning all the time. And, you know, we need to be intentional and conscious of that when we're facilitating um, daily routines in the classroom. And uh, well, I think we've talked about it in here in relation to infant care before, um, but you know, infant and, and to a certain extent toddler care, that is the bulk of, of their experience in a childcare setting. It's spent doing feeding, meal times, um, diapering and toileting and rest, you know, and so um, it, it's even more important, I think, especially with infants, not to lose sight of the importance of um, using these routines in a thoughtful way um, so that we can, you know, be guiding children's behavior and, and intentionally kind of embedding um, learning and, and developmental um, content in there for children. Um, you know, I, I just mentioned about the, the length of time that infants spend engaged in these personal care routines, um, but it's also important to think about variations in terms of infants' needs and, and all children's needs, but it shows up more, I think, uh, with, with younger children that, you know, some infants come to us and they're taking three or four naps a day, um, and then as they age and change, that usually shifts down to three, two, and then at some point, all children sort of transition into that similar schedule of the day where, you know, their, their variations in needs are not as great. But, and I know we've mentioned this before, there are still um, variations in need, right? And so some children need, you know, more um, downtime in the classroom or more rest. Some children might need an additional snack in the afternoon. Uh, I can remember a child as I was leaving my tenure at Generations, um, we were having some serious behavior challenges in the afternoon and in a parent-teacher conference, one of the strategies that was mentioned by mom was, you know, could we build in an additional snack in the afternoon because the child was there until 5.30, was always, you know, kind of melting down in the car wanting a snack and just sitting that child down and giving her, you know, some basic little bit, bit of fruit or some crackers made a huge difference in terms of how her behavior looked towards the end of the school day. Uh, and not something that we would have necessarily thought of because our typical, you know, meal times are breakfast, lunch, and snack at 2.30 or whatever. But for some children who are there very late in the day and, you know, have different needs than the other children, that was really important for her. Um, and so knowing your children, and that's one of the strategies that's mentioned in terms of personal care is knowing what's going to work for one child might not necessarily work for another. 
Um, but, you know, understanding children's individuality and then responding accordingly is super, super important. All children need a balance of vigorous and quiet activities um, and, you know, opportunities for play, eating, toileting, all those things that we've said. The role of culture is important to consider because by and large, people's attitudes and ideas about these things in particular, eating patterns, sleeping patterns, um, those are usually deeply rooted in personal and cultural values. You know, when we look at um, breastfeeding versus formula feeding, the, most of the time people have very strong um, personal beliefs on, you know, those, those ideas. The same thing with co-sleeping or sleep patterns. You know, some, some parents expect a child by a certain age to be laid down in a crib and, and do the whole thing themselves. And then some parents sleep with their children until they're well past, you know, uh, preschool age. Um, and again, you know, those are very, um, very circumstantial for different families, but important to know, right? That's the, the key piece is what does this family believe about how their child should be eating, sleeping, et cetera. And then how do we sort of merge that with you know, there are certain things like in an early childhood setting because of SIDS risk, um, you know, we, we put the child back to sleep, back to sleep. You always lay an infant down on their back in their crib. We are not allowed to put blankets in the crib. Those are things that there's no wiggle room um, for us in the early childhood setting because those are our, our licensing guidance and, and guidelines. So if we have a family who feels strongly, you know, in a different way, how do we meet them where they are while still honoring what we have to do uh, with children? And it, it goes back to open communication, right? Um, that's usually the most important piece is explaining our position, but also hearing the family and recognizing that um, just because something is different from what we feel or believe, it's not wrong. Um, and our job is to do our work and to do it in a way that's respectful of um, families' positions. And then when we think about the child's perspective, uh, this is something that relates back to kind of a theme that we've talked about all along. Um, in particular, you know, we talked about children's needs related to the environment and that need for children to feel a sense of control. Um, so children need that same sense of control over their their body, essentially, you know, over what's happening to their body. Um, if they're hungry, they they need to be able to express that and to be fed, even if it falls outside of the three mealtime examples that I gave you, you know, breakfast, lunch, and snack. Um, if they're tired, they need to be provided with opportunity to rest, even if it's not nap time. Um, and, you know, when, when adults make all of the decisions about children's schedule and their routine and their personal care with no input from the children, um, that is, is going to limit the children's development, really, you know, because it doesn't allow them to be autonomous and independent um, over expressing what they need and then having those needs met by responsive caregivers. Uh, and so sometimes we see adults get into power struggles or, you know, um, battles of will with children over things related to their personal care. Toilet training is a, you know, cornerstone example of this. Um, I have told a lot of people along the way that like, that is one thing that you, you just have to take a back seat to that. You can encourage, you can try to guide that process, but until a child decides that they want to eliminate in the toilet, there's not very much that you can do to, to change that. You know, that is something that they are very much in control of. And what I have seen is that when parents or caregivers try to force that and have that sort of power struggle with children, it usually takes the process much longer than it would if you just take the back seat and let the child lead the way on that one. Um, I would say the same thing of, you know, um, sleeping, sleeping independently, all of those things. Children are largely, um, they're able to exert control over that. And so what we need to do is to just, you know, um, sort of offer that to them and, and help guide, but not try to control um, their own personal care and uh, things that happen to their bodies. 
what to wear to school, you know, battles over clothing choices, um, another example. But the ultimate goal is that we want children to become, you know, healthy functioning adults, right, who know how to manage all of these personal care routines on their own. Um, and so as much as we can, we need to just sort of um, support that from a very early age. And that helps children become well-adjusted, productive, and self-directed. Um, when I say support children's development in all domains, think about, let's use mealtime as an example. Uh, what domains, well, first of all, the domains of development, you know, the, that's cognitive, social and emotional, physical. Um, am I missing any? Social, emotional, cognitive, physical. I think that pretty well covers it. So how do we support children's cognitive development during mealtimes? Or how might we? First and foremost, food is fuel for your brain, right? And your body. Um, so you need to be eating nutritious meals in order to think and work and play. Um, the same is true for us. And, and that is very much true for children. So from a very basic standpoint, the food that we provide um, has implications for children's cognitive development. How else might, might we support cognitive development during mealtimes? You could teach them like about the food that they're eating and kind of like what is good for their bodies versus maybe foods that they shouldn't be eating all the time. Kind of like the basics of like the food groups that you learn in school, things like that. Yes. And, you know, so there could be teaching related to what's on my plate, um, food groups, that type of thing. There's also so much opportunity during mealtimes to help children count and you know um, work out place setting and spatial relations and sing song I mean there's tons of opportunity for cognitive cognitive development to be happening during mealtimes if we're thinking about it and if we're being intentional and in how we're facilitating the mealtime I think mealtimes are also a really awesome time for children you know to reflect on I'm talking about lunchtime in particular or, or breakfast um, to reflect on their, the night before, or, you know, what did they play that morning? What did they learn? Um, you can embed all of that into conversation at mealtime. So I'm going to smush social and emotional together. How do we support social and emotional development during mealtimes? I feel like for um, kids get slightly distracted when they're trying to eat lunch. So like encouraging them, yes, to like talk with their peers, but also like focusing on eating their food all at the same time and like knowing when to speak and not to speak. Yes. So that turn taking social norm conversation type of learning definitely can happen during mealtimes. Um, and you have a little bit more maybe structure to the conversation because there are six people sitting at a table and that's kind of the expectation. So yes, helping children navigate that. Um, another thing that I think of is helping children be in touch with themselves and their own sort of regulation. So like stopping to eat, you know, don't overeat when your body feels full, that's when you stop. Um, and you can still sit at the table and participate in conversation and be part of the group, but you don't have to keep eating. Um, so we're helping them learn self-regulation. Um, and even back to what I just said in terms of, you know, reflecting on their morning or the night before at mealtimes, um, that type of self-awareness and introspective thinking is also a component of social and emotional development, you know? So again, tons of opportunity here. Um, and then physical development is pretty obvious in the same way that food is fuel for the brain. 
um, food is fuel for the body and without taking care of ourselves in that way, you know, we, we don't have energy to do what we want to do. These are the basic principles in terms of applying guidance in caregiving personal care routines that are outlined in those pages on the text, um, as well as on the document that you'll be using to reflect on the video of mealtime breakfast, I believe at Lucy Rock. Um, so, you know, important to be aware of these and to really what I want you to do is expand these and understand the strategies that go along with them. So an example of that is under um, knowing your individual children well enough to anticipate your needs some ideas there, which children are likely to come to school hungry in the morning, or in the example that I shared at the beginning of the call, um, you know, what children might need an additional snack at the end of the day based on the length of time that they spend in your program. How soon after a bottle is a particular baby likely to be hungry again? Um, how do they like to be held during their feedings? Some children, you know, um, I've had infants that have to be held in a certain position in order for them to drink their milk. And if, until you figure that out, you know, you're kind of at a loss. Um, but so knowing that, that level of nuance to each child, um, their pace, their own, you know, schedules and routines kind of outside of the daily flow of the classroom. Uh, we talked about this idea number three when we talked about environments, but making sure that your environment is set up in a way that allows children to be self-directed and autonomous. Um, and then we want to support that self-direction and autonomous by being present and being available to children, but not overstepping and kind of taking over what they can be doing independently. Um, I think when you're in the classroom at Lucy Brock, you will probably see lots of examples of that sort of scaffolding around personal care routines. Um, Lucy Brock is one of the places that I know that uses um, family style meal service. And that's a perfect opportunity to really kind of hit on numbers three and four. You know, they are um, providing the children with the tools and the utensils and the space um, and everything that a child needs to be successful, but they are supporting children in, you know, doing that meal service behavior kind of independent of the adult. Of course, we want to be modeling appropriate behavior um, and then using that those strategies from verbal guidance that we talked about last time to either direct or redirect behaviors. There are specific health and safety concerns um, when we talk about these mealtime, toileting, nap time routines. Um, so when we think about health and safety, it's, it's kind of important to think about two different components. There is the equipment necessary to keep children safe and well, and then the practices necessary. So, um, can I hear from you guys or if you would use the chat feature to just kind of give some examples of what do I mean when I'm talking about the equipment necessary for mealtimes, toileting, or rest? Why doesn't everyone just type something into the chat so we get like a running list of cots for rest? That's the most obvious one. Yes. Dishes, tables and chairs, cribs and cots. Um, have you guys ever been at Lucy Brock during nap time or, or in any classroom during nap time? Silverware, utensils. Um, someone said appropriately sized utensils and that appropriate low toilets. So appropriate size and even the furniture, you know, if we're expecting children to sit at a giant table, in giant chairs where their feet don't touch the floor um, for meal time. First of all, you know you're not going to have a very um, a very well functioning classroom, and that's against licensing guidelines. But but for a good reason, right? Because children need to be um, they need to be using appropriately sized materials. Um, and then I was going to say before the um, the idea of cribs and cots. That's really important, but there are um, 
hand washing. So the sinks, yes. There, there are some other considerations, especially for um, meal times and rest times that, you know, if you don't think of these until you're kind of in the middle of that routine, you're kind of missing something. So the lighting, the, the soft music playing, all of that stuff kind of sets the stage in terms of the environment um, to facilitate this routine in the smoothest, easiest way possible. And so, you know, typically what we see is while everyone's out on the playground or, you know, kind of engaged in some other activity, there's like a behind the scenes staff person that takes care of all of this. The cop fairy comes by and puts all the cops out and turns the lights down low and gets the music going. Um, but all of that, when the child comes into that space, that says to the child, this is what we're doing now. You know, it's time to start calming our bodies and we're gonna lay down and, and enjoy some quiet rest after lunch. Um, so same thing, chat feature, what are then some of the practices? What are the behaviors on the part of the adult that need to happen during mealtimes, diapering, toileting, or nap that relate to health and safety? And I'll, I'll talk about some other kind of health and safety concerns, um, cop sheets, they can not be dirty in disrepair. So if they have rips in them, um, those all have to be replaced and you know taken care of in kind of a timely fashion. <clears throat> um, anyone got thoughts on the practices? Making sure that the child is taking appropriate bites. That's kind of first and foremost in terms of meal times. Um, I think about appropriate sized food, monitoring for choking. So there is not just for socialization reasons, but there's also a safety reason why there should be one adult at every table. And with toddlers, the language reads within arm's reach of every child, you know? So you are supposed to be able to get to the child if they begin to choke in the process of eating their meal. Um, another consideration that comes to mind is the sign that Andrea showed, I'm sorry, that Dr. Anderson showed um, from Lucy Brock that said, this is a nut-free school. We have to be hyper aware of those type of situations for children, milk allergies, nut allergies, um, intolerances related to food, especially when children are coming to us and they haven't started eating yet, you know, because we are monitoring for if they're having some sort of reaction or something like that. Um, so lots of safety concerns around meal times. People in the chat are talking about rest time now, so I'll skip to that one. Um, and another related point for meal time is making sure that children are sitting safely in the chairs. Yes, uh, there's less of a likelihood to get choked if you're sitting safely uh, while eating instead of moving around. Um, and then uh, well I see a note in here about uh, practicing taking turns for the children going to the restroom so that it's not overwhelming and they can monitor smaller groups and the most important thing there is that we want to make sure children are having good hygiene practices and coming out of the bathroom you know clean and dry um, with clean hands and not all jumbled up in there kind of not going through the routine um, thoroughly and um, if the cots have wheels i assume is what annabelle's saying it, that the wheels are locked that's important um, and also blankets covering heads so at no time should a child of any age have something over their um, their face and head while they're resting in your care. Um, also another really important consideration. And with infants, I mean, anybody that works with infants in early childhood has to undergo, actually anybody that works in early childhood, um, they changed that regulation recently so that it's not just infant teachers, but um, a SIDS training. It's a two hour training that goes through so much information about safe sleep practices for infants and toddlers um, because you know there are a lot of um, safety concerns to kind of be aware of and to help prevent um, issues with in that setting. <clears throat> so goals for meal times we've talked about uh, you know the nutrition component, developing healthy habits, 
the energy element in terms of brain and physical development. And then I think we pretty much talked about um, supporting social and emotional needs as well. Um, I will mention in terms of this security and attachment piece, the picture that you see here with the um, infant taking a bottle, that especially I, I just, um, as a mother who nursed two babies um, for a fairly good while each, um, that time with your child is such a special um, bonding opportunity. And, and I think that it's easy to sort of forget that mothers are entrusting us as caregivers with that super special time, even if, you know, if they're pumping milk and bringing it to um, the childcare setting or, or providing formula for their child. Feeding a baby a bottle is, um, is not a time to sit and rock and talk to your, you know, people in the room that you're socializing with or a time to scroll on your phone. Um, that is a time where you should be making eye contact with the infant, you should be talking to them, you should be loving on them, um, because that security and attachment, that's where that kind of starts, you know, um, and so I think bottle routines for infants are um, really, really important to kind of remember that. Um, Goals for diapering and toileting. Obviously, you know, first and foremost, it's that good hygiene, staying clean. Um, another thing to think about is helping children learn to understand their internal cues. I mentioned this in relation to mealtime, but also in terms of toileting. You know, we want children to be recognizing that feeling of I need to go or indicating when they are wet or dry or soiled. Um, all of those things are super important. And then I think, you know, it's always been really important to uh, promote healthy hand washing habits with children. But I think in the society that we're living in now, um, that has become, you know, ever more important. Um, and so remembering to have conversation about that and to teach children good practices around that. And then this last item about, um, learning about bodies and gender differences. I think that's also really, uh, you know, this is kind of the beginnings of that. We want to make sure that we are um, giving children appropriate. Um, I usually just go with the scientific language around anatomy and body parts um, and, you know, teaching children to be uh, respectful of one another's privacy. All of those things start in, in the early years of um, diapering and toileting routines. So kind of building that in is also important. Um, any of you that have worked in a classroom, you, you're familiar with um, the hand washing and diapering routines. Those are handed down by the state. Um, and so there's an expectation that all childcare centers in the state of North Carolina are doing this process the same way and consistently. Um, and that's again, in an effort to keep children healthy and well, and, and staff members healthy and well, you know, there's a kind of a protocol there. And so when you're um, in the classroom observing, you know, you should see consistency in terms of how people um, put gloves on, facilitate the, the toileting or diapering routine, and then how they clean up afterwards. <clears throat> I think we've probably touched on all of these also um, in terms of goals for rest times. I know we've had conversation before um, about how uh, the adult's responsibility to sort of help children transition from play and eating into a more restful time of day by sitting with them, you know, snuggling with them, um, patting their back, helping them rest. But those simple uh, actions um, in terms of helping children make that transition are a, a way that we see number three, bullet point number three being um, facilitated in the classroom. That's how we build security and nurturing relationships um, through pleasant nap time routines. There's a big difference in sitting with a child and rubbing their back until they peacefully drift off to sleep than you know, someone standing in the corner yelling, lay down on your cot. Um, that's just not, that's not ideal, you know, so. Um, 
specific considerations for children. So we're going to kind of wrap up with looking at um, children with atypical patterns of development or cultural differences. Um, there is a need to make sure that we understand and consider developmental skills um, for children who hold an IFSP. That's the um, zero to two and a half, three realm, and then an IEP for three and up. Um, but, you know, sometimes children have accommodations related to mealtime, toileting, or rest that are important to know and then to facilitate. Um, the goal for all children, though, is that we meet them where they are and then support them in moving forward in terms of development. So even when we have a child with, you know, um, needing specialized types of support or with atypical um, patterns of development, the trajectory of development is always the same and we just meet the child where they are um, and, you know, help them move forward. That's why I think um, some, some places have, you know, really arbitrary rules about you have to be toilet trained before you can be in the preschool classroom. Um, I've known children with Down syndrome who are six and haven't mastered that skill yet. And so we wouldn't keep them in a toddler classroom at four years old or five years old just because they aren't using the toilet yet. Um, and, and then, you know, some, some people never master that skill. They need a support in that even as adults. Um, and so you know, that it's, we can't place unfair um, limits on a child's experience because of their ability or, or you know, not um, with these type of um, self-help skills. Um, and then again, I think this is critical for any child, but can be thought of specifically with children with disabilities is that it's important to emphasize um, what they can do and to recognize things from a strengths-based approach. Um, rather than, you know, focusing on the challenges. <clears throat> um, so, sorry, I skipped over a slide. Coordinating with families. Um, and so this can relate to children with, with atypical development or, um, you know, cross-cultural um, differences, diversity. Communication is essential. Again, because as I said at the beginning, caregiving, routine, ideas, and attitudes are so wrapped up in cultural norms. Um, and that, you know, recognizing if we disagree, it doesn't mean one of us is right or wrong. It's just that we need to come to consensus on how we're going to handle this in the center. Um, we've talked about how to kind of navigate these conflicts before, but taking time to understand each other's point of view and then try to come at, you know, some compromise. Um, I think the most important thing here to recognize though is that it is never our position as childcare providers to impose our uh, schedule of, like I'll use introducing solid food to an infant. Um, there is never a time when I would say that that's appropriate um, for a, a caregiver to give a, a, an infant solid food without, you know, um, permission, agreement on the part of the family. Um, same thing with toilet use. You know, you're not going to start toilet training a child in childcare without having conversation with the family about, you know, what are their behaviors with toileting at home? Do you all see signs of readiness and feel like we should take this step? Um, so again, I think it's, partnership with families, engaging families, um, and then, you know, to whatever extent we can, being respectful and honoring the family's wishes. <clears throat> um, yeah, so I think that pretty much summarizes our discussion on personal care routines. My hope is that the video that you see um, for your asynchronous work will kind of help give you a visual and some practical application of some of what we've talked about here. Um, and then we are coming up on spring break. So I hope that you all have plans to at least do something um, maybe warmer <laughs> and um, safe and that is all I have. If you will type your name in for attendance purposes before you hop off.
Um, and then, yeah, I will not see you next week, but we'll come back together the following week. I will mention also that um, midterms, you can kind of get a sense of how you did because 31 of the 41 questions are graded automatically, um, but I am working my way through your short answer. And so after you come back from spring break, those grades will be finalized for sure. All right, I'll be here for a minute or two, but you guys are free to go.